Welcome to I Hate It Here, the podcast for HR and people professionals, making the hardest job in the world just a little bit easier. I'm Hibi Youssef. We've sadly come to the end of our time together this season, but rest assured we are going out with a banger today and I will be back next season, which kicks off at the end of September. So mark your calendars now. This podcast will always be in your ears on Mondays, every Monday to get you through the work week. So today, what are we talking about? Hmm. Well, in every generation, there's a chosen one. Um, actually, sorry, that's the intro to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, not the intro to this podcast episode today. But we are talking about something kind of relevant to Buffy, generations. Currently, we have five generations in our workforce. We have the traditionalists who were born before 1946, the baby boomers who were born between 1946 and 1964, Gen X, which were born between 1965 and 1980, millennials, woo, born between 1981 and 1996, and Gen Z born after 1997. And having five generations in the workplace is bound to create some issues and force leaders to potentially consider changing their leadership style. So that's what we're talking about today. We're going to debunk some stereotypes. We're going to talk about what these generations want. And we're going to talk about how you can actually manage and lead an organization if you have five generations in your current workforce. I would hedge my bets and say most of you do not, but we'll get into a little bit about that soon. Dave, welcome back. You were here last week. You're here this week. You know, you're giving me a lot of time. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Hibbo. You know, I just enjoy our conversations so deeply. Because <laughs> we're just making jokes and trying to get through life one day at a time. Together. Together. And we're talking about industry, which I I need a whole episode on that because I don't, this show just gives me anxiety. It just gives me anxiety. I can't not watch it and not feel anxious the whole time. Is that just it, me? It, it, no, it peaked the last two episodes. I have not watched this past Sunday, so no spoilers. And the last episode I watched was the one with Rishi. And if you don't watch Industry, it's on HBO. I recommend you watch it. I've been watching it since the very first season. And it gives me anxiety every Sunday night. <laughs> Just don't don't eat while you watch this episode. Okay, good to know. Okay. I, oh, God, no. Also, don't watch it with your parents. My friend was like, I'm going to start this show with my parents. I was like, please don't. I just, it's, I don't know who's, I don't know what kind of parents you have, Dave. My parents would not want to be watching that show ever it's, it, it's definitely not a multi-generational show <laughs> i love that tie in back to our conversation today okay so we're talking about a lot of generations in the workplace and before we even started you made the comment how many traditionalists do i actually know who are still working today and i thought that was a very interesting observation because everyone is talking about these five generations but i don't know how many people are actually working with people who were born before 1946 I think it depends on your industry and social class. Um, you know, this this country doesn't necessarily have a solidified safety net. And so there are certainly people above the age of 75 who are still working, service industries, retail. Um, I do know folks who work into their 80s uh, in their own personal ventures as well. Um, but I haven't really interacted with folks well into their 70s in corporate America for a few years. Yeah, me neither. I do. I mean, I think, I mean, I work in an early stage startup, right? That's going to potentially attract a few people. And while today's topic is not about ageism, I think that very really exists in the workplace. I know a lot of older women who face it daily as they're exploring new opportunities. And they've talked about how hard it is to either re-enter the workforce or still get considered for opportunities. And I think potentially that's a topic for another day because our, our bias towards people's age is, is very real. I think just generally there's a level of unconscious bias in this conversation across the board, um, whether that's bottom up or top down. Uh, there's there's unconscious bias that affects every decision um, from hiring to cross-functional work um, to uh, team building. Um, but, but certainly there is a, a significant bias on hiring folks who are um, – middle-aged and above. Yeah. And without children or personal life responsibilities sometimes too. Totally. I find a lot of, a, a lot of comments get made about people and their children in the workplace. And I'm just like, first of all, we don't do that. Second of all, that's none of your business. Like I'm always mind boggled to people. I've, I've heard horror stories of someone telling me, well, 
I had a hiring manager who said they didn't want to hire this woman because she was pregnant or she was, or she had kids and she, they were worried about her focus at work. And I was like, why is the hiring manager even bringing that up? So like the, the fact that people feel emboldened enough to say things like that just prove that there's probably very deep unconscious bias when it comes to people's ages. They're probably just not saying it as vocally as they have said other things. So what challenges have you seen when leading a multi-generational workforce? Uh, I, I think it comes down to three things. Uh, it's communications, expectations, and motivations. Um, and I think every generation has a different standard for those three things and different um, different ways of looking at their job through those lenses. Uh, and so we're both millennials, so I'll speak about I'll speak about us first. Um, but from a motivation standpoint, uh, we are uh, intrinsically motivated to uh, like continue, our, like for continuous productivity. It is the the bane of our generation's existence that we always want more. We have this hustle mindset that uh, you know we have to do better than uh, our parents who came before us, and we're in this constant pursuit of productivity in our personal life, in our work life. Um, and it all bleeds together. The other aspect of that motivation is that we generally are attracted to roles where we feel like we can align with the company's purpose. Uh, and so that, uh, again, in, 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 in a consistent, um, a c- consistent narrative around the bring your whole self to work, aligning with the company's purpose is a uniquely millennial trait that wasn't, um, wasn't uh, adopted by the generations uh, before us. And so that those are the, the motivation uh, for millennials. When it comes to communications, you know, millennials generally like direct communication. Um, they want to know that it's a reciprocal dialogue uh, where they, it's not a, a top down, but it is a conversation, um, but still direct uh, and straightforward and goal oriented. Uh, is how millennials like to receive communication. And then on expectations, and maybe you've experienced this, uh, millennials always want to know what's coming next. When am I getting promoted? What, when is my performance review? How am I doing? They're constantly checking in for feedback on their performance and uh, you know, want expectations to be clearly set so that they could hit those productivity milestones. So if you look at that that comprehensive view, no other generation acts that way. <laughs> um, and there are differences between how each generation uh, how each generation um, uh, resolves their motivations, communications, and expectations. And I think the challenge we're having today in the workplace is millennials are moving into executive leadership positions. And we are now being asked to manage both up and down uh, from an age standpoint. And we are having trouble understanding the motivations, communication patterns, and expectations uh, of, uh, of the other generations. And so I will not pretend to intimately understand those three things for all the other generations as I do for ours. But I think that's the crux of the problem. Um, what I've recognized, though, is that regardless of generation, every generation wants the leader to lead. Uh, they just may appreciate the different ways and styles in which that leader is leading. I think like the the call out there, like you will not pretend to know all the other generations. I say the same thing. Like I'm, I'm just someone who's like trying to navigate work with my lived experience too. And so the interesting thing is every single generation brings their lived experience to the workplace and that actually informs how they behave and interact with the rest of us. And I think like HR should do a better job potentially of like really understanding who is in their workforce and what it is they want. And I think it, it comes back to those three things you did mention. And I like the way you framed it, like comms, expectations, and motivations are a very interesting way to think about each generation. Um, on the note of each generation, I did want to play a fun game called I Ask Chat GPT, which is a game I play quite regularly every day sometimes. Um, so I asked Chat GPT to uh, share some stereotypes that are often uh, associated with the different generations. And I just wanted to share a little bit with you and see 
you know, live reactions, nothing scripted, but what you think. So I asked about the traditionalists who, again, were born from 1928 to 1945. So we're talking World War, end of World War One, most of World War Two, or some of World War II. Um, their stereotypes that it shared with me were resistant to change and risk averse, loyal to employers and expect long-term commitment, prefer face-to-face communication, value hierarchy, respect authority, reluctant to embrace new technology, hardworking, disciplined, and detail-oriented. What would you say? Who am I to argue with ChatGPT about our grandparents? <laughs> so true. Also, I'm just reading this description and I'm like, these are people who face like what we're talking like a war, major world wars, the end of the Great Depression, right? Great Depression ended in 1920s. Now this is turning into a history podcast, my favorite subject. And I mean, I'm not surprised that this is the way they behave. So let's look at, okay, baby boomers, which so, are- So can I, can, can, yeah. can I just make a point on this? Um, yeah. I, I do think like there is like inherent bias in ChatGPT that you're calling out because out of all the generations, uh, no generation has seen as much change as that generation. Uh, yeah. so if you think about the progression of the world since 1928, it's a hundred years. This is why I said, I don't know how many people are, are, uh, you know, still active in the workforce, but they have seen, um, a massive amount of change happen in their lifetimes. Yeah. And we'll talk about this concept a, a little later, but this concept of digital natives versus digital immigrants, um, they, they have been, uh, immigrants to every technological advancement um, that has happened over the last hundred years. And so I do think there's an undue level of bias in that description about them uh, because they manifested, they not only manifested the change, but assimilated to it and then helped it to succeed, to, you know, succeed and grow. And so it is a little bit of a, of a, that, that, that declaration is a bit of a misnomer on, on that generation. Yeah. I, I mean, this is fun. Now, but now let's play a game called We Call Chat GPT Out, <laughs> where we go through each of these and call them out. <laughs> okay, baby boomers, which were born between 1946 and 1964. Again, these are pe- folks that were born before segregate, like during segregation, before the Civil Rights Acts were passed, before uh, no women had the right to vote by 19, 1920. I think women got the right to vote. Um, but okay, let's see what Chat GPT says about them stereotypes. They're workaholics who value work as central to identity. They prefer structured environments and are resistant to flexibility, value loyalty, long hours, and in-person meetings, less tech savvy, slow to adopt new technologies, strong sense of hierarchy and respect for titles, and prioritize stability and financial security. I think going back to what you said about the traditionalists, like these are folks that I mean, this is, I'm thinking about my mom, like my mom was born during this time. My mom's had to uh, watch the invention of like the cell phone, the internet. She now uh, knows how to send a voice note, which was a big improvement in our communication. But I'm like, I'm thinking about these folks in the workplace and like they've seen massive change and the average person is not really great at handling change. So back to what you said about the traditionalists, like I think we're enforcing these stereotypes. Again, it's a chat GPT enforced stereotype funny because i'm asking it about stereotypes i have been um you could call it fortunate or unfortunate i don't don't know i don't know which one i would call yet but i've been in in situations where uh someone who was previously my supervisor became my employee uh and this has happened to me uh several times uh probably at, at least 10 times this has happened to me in my career where somebody who i formerly worked for ended up working for me. And almost always those folks were baby boomers, right? So I was part of a you know, millennial cohort that started you know, coming into corporate America and then ultimately was on a growth trajectory. And folks who were um, more senior in their career ended up working for me. And I did not find those folks nor other folks of their generation to be resistant to change. Um, I, I found them to be very thoughtful. I found them to be uh, s- s- thoughtful in um, and more risk averse, but not necessarily uh, detriment, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think we have a tendency as a generation to kind of like go, go, go. 
Um, and I, I think one day a book will be written on how much Facebook influenced this generation's working style. Not only the folks that worked at Facebook, but the idea of Facebook mm-hmm. and the ideas that Facebook presented to us, it, like move fast and break things. It just permeated so much of how we operate. And so I, I think that that, uh, that tendency for us to kind of like go, go, go was met with a counterweight of the generation before us in saying, slow down, kid. Yeah. Uh, and they created a natural tension. And like everyone else, we've skipped over Gen X. Um, but we haven't gotten there yet. They're the next no, one. No, no I, I, I know. But Gen <laughs> X is this interesting, um, this interesting in between mm-hmm. uh, count, counterculture um, kind of generation that is often overlooked in this in this conversation. Yeah. Um, but they also have different uh, different view on work where they certainly think more about uh, the role of authority. Uh, They certainly think more around work-life balance. Like they introduced the concept of work-life balance into the workplace. Um, But they actually value more than millennials and boomers uh, autonomous work. Mm. Whereas both millennials and boomers like hierarchy for different reasons. But millennials love hierarchy because it's the productivity ladder. It's like, oh, I can see where I'm going. Yeah. Um, whereas boomers enjoy like hierarchy because there's clarity in role definition and clarity in um, uh, in responsibility and and decision making. So, wh- whereas Gen X doesn't like doesn't like it at all. Uh, and so, you know, there's there are aspects of this that kind of permeate everything from organizational design to cross-functional work. Um, The point being that I I, I think we get wrapped up in uh, stereotypes that often misclassify or misunderstand the root cause of the generational conflict. Mm. First of all, you said so many good things. I was actually taking notes while you were talking. This is why I love talking to you. This is truly why you should be on the podcast every season because the one, the comment about the Facebook, how Facebook is going to impact our work, the, that book, somebody's definitely writing it. If not, they're listening to this podcast and then they're writing it. So Dave, maybe you should write it. I don't know. Um, but the reinforcing of our stereotypes is just, it's so interesting asking ChatGPT because ChatGPT is like everything on the internet, right? So it already is doing all that and giving it to us. Um and then hearing how it responds to these people and how misunderstood potentially a lot of people could feel at work. But the point for HR is we're designing these systems essentially with an end goal of like, what does the user want? And the user is these employees and the employees may vary across these generations. And so ultimately the answer might be the users want a lot of different things, but we still have to design the system that works in our organization. And so I think that is also like a constant struggle of HR is when we're thinking about people's motivations, what they want out of work. Sometimes it's so hard to balance all of those motivations to build a system that actually works for everyone. I feel like it's like a never ending struggle of push and pull of feedback and what do people want and how do people want to be led and what kind of manager they're looking for and how they show up for work. And that tension I think will always exist because we're all different. I I think this is um, like core to this uh, discussion is that the job of HR is never done. And there, there is a tendency to say, okay, we wrote the employee handbook check. We, 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 we built the, the meeting structure check. We've done the performance process check. And the, the thing about organizations is that they are living, breathing organisms in and of themselves. And the organizations want to grow. This is why people will uh, 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 negotiate for budget, negotiate for headcount, negotiate for scope, because they want to grow. The organization has uh, an appetite to grow. Um, and so with growth comes change. And so some, these things are never done. And if you think about your organization as a living, breathing organism, it needs different things at different times of its, of its life cycle. And so 
to say that the job of organizing people is ever done is so incorrect given how organizations change and are constantly changing. Um, so I would keep that in mind as you, you stakeholder your leaders and you talk through what the real responsibility of HR is. Um, a business operating system needs releases just like software. And so it, it needs to constantly evolve and change. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to go on a tangent, but let's go. Okay. Let's go back to our stereotypes. We can keep talking about this. I don't even know if we want to cover more of these stereotypes, but Gen X, they gave us the skeptical and independent values, work-life balance. Excellent fact about how they introduced work-life balance to us. Thank you. They're born 1965 to 1980. Pragmatic, self-reliant, resourceful, comfortable with technology, but not as immersed in it as younger generations. Clear expectations, they prefer clear expectations and autonomy at work and are value, viewed as less lawyer, loyal to employers compared to the boomers because they're changing jobs more frequently. Were, was Gen X really the generation that changed more? I feel like when I entered the workplace, everyone was like, millennials, they're changing jobs every two years. I can't believe it. Was Gen X really the generation that started that? They started it. We we certainly took it to the next, next level. <laughs> uh, but they started it. And I think it's important to say like that coincided with the rise of knowledge work. It coincided with the internet age um, and just different types of work became more accessible. Uh, and, and so, you know, that transformation happens. It also coincides with the offshoring of American manufacturing. Uh, and so the kinds of, and the elimination of pensions, mm -hmm. the, the kinds of jobs that you had previously or the kinds of structures in place that supported your continued employment at a single employer changed. Um, and, and so like none of these things can be looked at in isolation. We always like borderline on politics in these podcasts, but yeah. so much, so much of how, how work is structured mm -hmm. is related to policy regulation and government. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the government is the biggest employer in the country. So there's just so much of it that's interconnected. Um, but Gen X had that, that transition. And so they ushered in the kind of idea that you could have multiple employers and a really worthwhile career. Yeah, there was so much policy. So like, right, the Gen X is born 1965 to 1980. So let's say they're entering the workforce at, right, what, what are they, 20 in 2000? Right, they're entering the workforce at the, wow, Y two. The oldest, the oldest ones are twenty and two thousand. Right, yeah. so you know you're coming in in the nineties, effectively. Yeah, you're seeing uh, we're ending wars, but very fascinating time because a lot of policy about work is also being passed in the government. If you look back, I've written about presidents and legislation. Every President's Day, that's my send. I write about presidential legislation and like when it's passed. And a lot of stuff is being passed in the early 90s and like 80s. And so we're seeing the impact to work from like a policy perspective, from like an actual political perspective. And it's really interesting, like more women are entering the workforce then, right? Like I think in, in 1980 was the year that women were allowed to get credit cards, like very interesting workforce analysis you could do about like the actual makeup of the workforce is changing and, and Gen X was a part of all of that. And so I think like that's really interesting too. It's not just – they just didn't show up to work one day and we're like work-life balance, right? They're experiencing the world and how it shows up and how they show up in it and that's informing how they can show up at work. So really interesting generation. I'll give you one stat. Uh, when Title IX was passed in the 70s, men outpaced women as college graduates by 13 points. Um, today, men, uh, women outpace men as college graduates by 15 points. So that inversion is almost unheard of in any other domain. Uh, and so, you know, however we're thinking about work today, we will think about work much, much differently 20 years from now. Isn't that fun? I hope we're still friends in Can't 20 wait. years and doing this podcast and then coming back to this episode. Like, remember what, how goofy we were in 2024? <laughs> and then whatever it is at that point, Generation XYZ is going to say, do you know any millennials that are still working? Like, it's going to be us. <laughs> <laughs> those those millennials so cringe can't stand them. <laughs> S sending their gifs 
leave me alone. I love my gifts, okay? I'm also working on memes, but it's just that's it. It's so fascinating. Like, I, I don't know. I'm such a geek that I will geek out on this possibly forever, but how the world changes and how that impacts work is so cool to me. And I think that's just life. And I am just really passionate about watching what happens at work. It's like, it's cool to see it. It's like interesting to talk to my siblings, to talk to my parents, to talk to older generations I know and ask them how they felt about work. And it also informed a lot of my work. Like I remember when I was changing jobs every two years, my brother, who is uh, Gen X, was like, I cannot believe you're changing another job. Like you need to stay in your job for more than three years. Like no one's going to hire you. That's going to be a stain on your resume. Like how could you? And I, I honestly remember being like, your advice is whack. And he was so <laughs> mad at me. He was so mad at me. He was like, shut up. And I was like, no, but like that's not how I'm experiencing work. And I think that's just – really cool to see how other generations did it. And like my dad, the first question he asked, I probably have shared this like a million times. The first question he asked every time I took a new job was what's your 401k contribution? Like what's, what's your employer contributing? What are you contributing? Are you contributing enough? Like not what's the title. He never asked about the title. He never asked like, what's the responsibilities? What's the scope of work? No, my dad had one, one ask, what's the 401k and make sure you are contributing it to set yourself up for life. He was the pension generation. Mm-hmm. So. And he loved it. He was like so loyal to his employers and like loved it. Actually, really funny side story. I was in Virginia Beach last week cleaning out my family home. So we have just been sitting on this home and we really need to clean it out. It's my childhood home. I grew up in it. But my dad uh, had his PhD in business management. And I never really understood what that was because in the 90s growing up, like he was always teaching about Six Sigma. And I was like, I don't even understand this. Like, <laughs> this is, we'll tell you what, like whatever, right? Only for me to go home and clean out his office and to find all these books about organizational development, how to build learning cultures, the importance of a leader, like all these things. And I'm, I'm sitting in his office cleaning out these books and like literally thinking, did my whole life just lead me to this exact work? And I never even knew. And my dad passed before I started doing a lot of this work, right? He, I was like barely getting into HR. And so I like never had any of these conversations with him. I'm cleaning out his office and I'm seeing all these books and I'm just like, was I always destined to just end up here? Like, <laughs> am I my father's child? Like, did he inject it in me? Like, is it in my DNA to want to talk about organizational cultures and like building learning things? And it was a very like, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. Like grief is weird, but it was like a very, mo it was a moment that was like very heavy. And at the same time, I was like, well, this is my work now. Like <laughs> This is my legacy, I guess. So it's been real fun. It's the legacy of your family, not just yours. Apparently, like my dad, this was my dad's thing. Like he loved this and loved talking about it, you know? So I get to talk about it now for the rest of my life. It's a beautiful story. Oh, thanks, Dave. I didn't cry while telling it, so I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> but it was really cool. He had all these books, and I like kept some of them because I was like, th these books are still so relevant to the conversations we're having today about leadership styles and why people show up to work and what's motivating them. So there's so much to say. We're still playing my game back to my game about ChatGPT, although we covered millennials. I don't want to cover that one more time. Last thing I want to touch on, and then we'll go back to leading through multi-generations and styles and things to consider for this episode, is Gen Z. Gen Z was born in 1997 to 2012. I was a fully formed human with opinions who loved in sync at that time. Real, really big in sync year. 1998 was a big in sync year. Um, and they are a fascinating generation to me. So they're the digital natives who are constantly connected via technology. They want fast feedback, instant gratification. They value DEI and social responsibility in the workplace. They have entrepreneurial mindsets focused on side gigs and financial independence. And they're seen as having short attention spans, rude, and a, and a preference for visual learning, same, uh, highly adaptive to change and expect remote or hybrid work options. And Gen Z has kind of been uh, the talk of the town. Everyone's talking about how do I support my Gen Z talent and what do I do when they're asking us our political stance on things that are happening in the world? What do I do? So what's your take on Gen Z, recognizing neither one of us is from Gen Z? I think part of this is them growing up with complete access to mobile phones and the internet. And there is a kind of infinite nature to discovery when 
you have the internet in the palm of your hand. Um, the phrase that I mentioned earlier, the difference between digital natives and digital immigrants. You and I would still be considered digital immigrants where we've come to technology and we've come to the internet um, later in life. For us, it was maybe in our teens, uh, whereas Gen Z was or were what are considered digital natives. They were born with it. And so even though we are multilingual uh, and we remember a world before all of this technology overtook our lives, they do not. And so what does the kind of infinite nature of discovery and the boundaryless um, kind of exploration uh, mean for work? Uh, it means that they have no problem sending a Slack DM to anybody at any time about any subject matter uh, with, you know, in, in an informal way. Uh, and there are norms and normative behaviors that millennials have uh, adopted at work that make engagement with Gen Z seem to be uh, seem to be somewhat challenging. Um, and I, I said this: uh, there is an, an unaired episode of this podcast between him and I that you will never see. Uh, but on that pod, um, we talked about how uh, millennials traded in uh, a sh- shirt and tie and formal attire for hoodies and jeans, but effectively kept all of the same workplace structures in place that previous generations did. And so that, that kind of assimilation, um, when Gen Z is coming up and actually doing things differently, whether that's gig work, whether that's asynchronous communication, um, whether that's, uh, you know, using um, uh, general AI tools to do their jobs and accomplish their work in a way that millennials don't do are uncomfortable with or have challenges with it creates that generational conflict because we took the structures and made them our own whereas gen z is not necessarily interested in the structures uh, and the norms so i think that's where the crux of the conflict comes into play Um, with regards to the chat gpt stereotypes i I don't know uh, enough to say right or wrong Um, i will say the the thing that I have recognized, which is the most challenging aspect of this, is millennials and Gen Zs do not have common cultural like language, uh, and and that's where the breakdown happens. Um, you know, wh- whether it's uh, referencing TV shows and cultural touchstones or slang, th- th- there's just a complete and utter disconnect. Uh, between millennials and Gen Z, um, I'll give you. I'll give you one. You, you ready? Here's one. Yes. What do you think Gen Z and Gen Alpha call hot dogs? Why wouldn't you call them hot dogs? They call them glizzies. No, I'm uninterested in this. <laughs> no. So my my point, yeah. my point being, if you are a millennial leader making an office reference, or you're making a reference to the Care Bears, they have no idea what you're talking about, none whatsoever. Yes, yes so, I did. I I think I told you this. I made a joke about the OC or like One Tree Hill, and the person I was working with was this was her first job out of college, and she was like, "Yeah, I was in kindergarten when that." Show. She just like Googled it and was like, "I was in kindergarten when that show was on TV," and I was like, "Oh God." fuck <laughs> literally i was like i am gonna, i'm the crypt keeper like i like and never in my life have i felt it's so wild i say this all the time i feel so old for being relatively still young and i don't know if it's like gen z i don't know if it's my own internal internalized age angst about like milestones in my life and where i've made it or if it's just that the next generation doesn't get any of my pop culture references, so now I have to make new pop culture references. But you're not you're not in the, you're not in their culture. I'm not in their culture, and I should just let that go. My nephews sometimes will talk to me, and I'll be like, "What are you talking about?" Like my nephews are 10, 10 and eleven, eleven and twelve, I think. Uh, twelve. I actually, I don't know how old my nephew is. I'm not going to lie. I just went to his birthday and I can't even remember. But anyways, <laughs> I asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up. I was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, you know, career on. And he was like a YouTuber. And I was like, no, thank you. 
I literally was like, no, sir, try again. You're a, you, no. you are a creator. Yeah, but like he doesn't know his aunt is a creator. He doesn't think I'm like cool or anything. He's like watching Mr. Beast and that other guy who's problematic, whose name I can't remember, but he has that energy drink. Logan Paul. That guy. <laughs> He's problematic, right? Isn't he problematic? Problematic. <laughs> I mean, I don't know because I didn't know who he was. I had to Google him. I was like, I don't even – they're talking a foreign – like sometimes my nephews, I feel like are speaking a foreign language. I'm like, I don't understand. They're Gen Alpha. And I'm like, I don't – the second that they get into the workplace, I'm just going to be like, that's it. Retire me. Put me out to pasture. I can't, I can't be here anymore. I can't do well, it. Well, they will, they will be the millennials to the boomers, right? So we came in. <laughs> we came in and the boomers were two generations ahead of us. And when they come in, we'll be the boomers. I don't can't we need to move on because I'm gonna cry about this later to myself um I love that we talked about the role of technology because I think about that a ton uh thinking about how you know we're dealing we've talked about all these generations potential stereotypes false if or not maybe true um I want to share a stat that I read in this article because I thought was really interesting and it was about culture And they did a – Forbes did this article. I can link to it in the um, chat. But it was the 2022, which still I feel feels outdated. They did a study about – a generation study about corporate culture. And more than 90% of the employees self-reported that culture impacts their decision to stay within a company. But baby boomers are not very consumed with the company's culture, with less than 30% saying it didn't have much of an impact on them remaining at the organization. And then on the other side of the generational spectrum, Gen Z and millennials report that culture plays a big part in their intent to stay with their employer nearly at 40% for the two groups. So we have baby boomers saying it doesn't really matter. We have millennials and Gen Z. I don't understand how they're on the other, I guess they're 40% and baby boomers are 30%. But I thought that stat was really interesting around culture because I kind of want to dig into a little bit about like, how do you actually foster a culture of respect and inclusivity when employees have such a varying sense of values, work styles, preferences? Like how how do we as leaders actually do that when they even think about culture differently? and value it differently? I think that that question, um, the polling question is very interesting because I would love to understand the definitions of culture across those three generations Mm. because I imagine that they define culture differently. Um, And what is workplace culture? They define it differently. Um, if If you think about the time, the vast majority of Gen Zs started entering the workforce during the pandemic. Uh, and so the role that culture played during the pandemic, uh, I'm going to imagine was different than the role that it played for us growing up in an organization or for boomers growing up in an organization, um, to align on definitions, the way that I define company culture is how teams manifest, share and protect their collective beliefs. So they have to have established collective beliefs. And then those collective beliefs have to come out in everyday work uh, and they need to be something that is broadly shared and protected, right? So, uh, you know, we don't schedule meetings here is like a way to protect your asynchronous culture, right? Uh, If you work asynchronously and mostly online uh, is a way that I would think about that. But, you know, collective beliefs are both formal and informal. Uh, they are the formal policies and structures and um, methods of communication and connection that the company creates. But then there's also the informal aspects of work, which is how decisions happen, how folks actually talk to one another, um, and kind of the invisible layer of how a company operates. And so I think if you asked each generation how they would define culture, you may get different answers. You may get, oh, it's how we connect as a team. You may get it's the company's purpose. You may get, it's the company's impact on the world. You may get, um, you know, it's, uh, all of the, the kind of benefits and, um, social, social structure set up at work for us to engage, right? You may get a variety of answers. And so I'm curious to understand in that polling question, like how did they define, um, culture for each generation to your question? Um, which was, 
how do we foster a culture of respect and inc- inclusivity when uh, folks are multi-generational? I think this is one aspect of the approach that should be universal. And companies should think about how they establish a culture that is worthwhile and one that they encourage assimilation. Uh, because ultimately, the company has a set of objectives that it's trying to achieve. It has a organizational structure that they've put in place to believe that that is the optimal way to achieve uh, said goal. And the culture is how it happens. Uh, and so if there's nothing to assimilate to, uh, then you have uh, cult like cultural rejection, right? Where people try to bring their own culture, or they try to establish a culture, whereas the company should have its own culture. And tying into the podcast that we uh, filmed last week, um, you know, a lot of this goes back to the shadow of the leader or the shadow of the founder or the shadow of the executive team and establishing the culture of the organization. But in my view, this has to be a, a universal approach to culture development that you encourage the generations to assimilate to. So the encouragement can be multi generational and bespoke as you talk to each generation about culture but you want them to adopt a way of working that is best suited for the organization to thrive. Wow. I I loved that description. And I checked in the polling data and they don't tell you how they define culture. Of course not. Story of our lives. Story of our lives. Anyways, I'll link to the article if anyone wants to read it. And um, it's very interesting. It's about the five generations coexisting in the workplace. But I like that concept of, you know, universal culture and really thinking at, the thinking that people will assimilate is really interesting to me because I had a very negative reaction when you said the word assimilate in my personal self. Cause I was like, Oh, I don't want to assimilate. I want to be like different than everyone. And I'm like now thinking back to all the cultures I've deeply struggled with were all the ones that I couldn't assimilate. And I didn't, I didn't belong there for lack of a, a not as good way of saying it. If that made any sense, it, it, but if if that's the case, you and the company are probably better off that yes. you are not there anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Because the, the company exists to achieve a set of objectives. Whether or not the culture is uh, ir- irrespective, irrespective of the quality of the culture, the the fact that it exists and it is a way that that company operates, uh, you know, it, ha- it 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 in a way should be respected, right? Uh, And so either you want to work there or you don't want to work there as an individual. And I I think for a long time, uh, our generation believed that you could change the culture of the company by planting your flag and saying, I'm going to be the agent of change here. And quite frankly, that it, that doesn't work. It doesn't. We've seen it fail over and over and over again. And so I think you're better suited in finding a culture you want to be a part of in the same way you find your friend group, you join a, a social club or fraternity or sorority. You have a, a, you pick your cafeteria lunch table in high school. You find where you're most comfortable. Uh, and not everything is to your liking, but you find where you feel like you can thrive. The same thing happens in a company. Yeah. I th- I'm now thinking back to like every culture I've tried to change. And I'm like, was I ever really ever successful? And I feel like the answer is no. <laughs> no. No. And I'm not mad about it because I, I feel very blessed right now that I get to work with like people who mostly align with how I value things. And that seems to work better. It's working the best for me than it ever has anywhere else. But I think that like push and pull of assimilating or changing is hard because a lot of us view ourselves as change agents in HR. Like we're going to change it. We're going to make it all better. And when I try to tell people when they come to me and say like, I want to change my company culture, how would you do it? Oftentimes I do say like, start with the fact that you might not be able to change it. In the very first podcast we did together, we got that question Yeah, uh, from a live audience. And we told them that if you can't make any progress, you should leave. That's still how I feel. That is still how I feel like it's, it can be impossible. This job is impossible. Sometimes it's especially impossible if the culture itself does not want to change. Um, okay. Let's touch on, we're talking about multi-generational workforces. Just hit me with some benefits of having a multi-generational workforce. Um, so just foundationally, it makes your business better. Uh, you, you can identify customers in a more meaningful way. Uh, if you look at, uh, 
two companies. One of them, uh, one of them is a little older. One of them is a little younger. We talked about Meta earlier, but if you look at Meta and Apple over the last ten years, they have both started creating more and more services for older generations as the executives age, and so. <laughs> It's just a completely missed opportunity for the 10 years before that, that they didn't have a multi-generational workforce that could help them see these opportunities. So what do I mean by that? Yesterday, Apple announced that the new AirPods will have a hearing aid function. I guarantee you, if the majority of the executive team was not middle age, they would not even have thought of the hearing aid function. Uh, Meta now has lots and lots of services for parents because the overwhelming majority of meta users and meta executives are millennials who are having kids. And so all of these services that they have for parents, whether it's groups or marketplace, suburban services, all of these exist now because the team has recognized the opportunity. The same thing happened to Microsoft. They updated, they had made a really material update to uh, Windows and their Surface line of laptops during the pandemic because they all started working from home and had to use the laptops. And so that next generation that came out after it had all these enhancements that people had been asking for because they had to experience them firsthand. And so the, the lived experience that you called out, I think is extremely important in how companies create products and services for their customers. And if you don't have a multi-generational workforce, you cannot empathize with the lived experience of the different generations, and so you miss out on uh, potential opportunities as a business. Um, you see it today now where uh, different companies struggle with reaching different ages, um, and certain companies do well um, with, with uh, age groups and not well with others. Uh, so Roblox does really well with you know kids 5 to 15, where Fortnite does really well with kids 16 to 30, not kids anymore, but 16 to 30, right? So different generations use these different games when in fact the games are somewhat similar um, in functionality and like the open world nature of them. I'm not a gamer to know intimately, but you look at how well each company does, th there's a curiosity in why they can't be successful with other generations, right? Uh, and part of that is the intimate knowledge of a particular, a particular age group. And so I think having a multi-generational workforce allows you to build deeper knowledge across different age groups, demographics, and psychographics of your customer base, uh, and ultimately creates opportunities for you as a business. So that's one uh, advantage of having a multi-generational workforce. Um, the second uh, uh, kind of uh, advantage to having a multi-generational workforce is when you have a workforce that's more reflective of the world, it means your company is more relevant. Uh, and I think that is especially important for uh, consumer brands, uh, especially important for um, companies that serve mass audiences and being able to have relevance and relate to the broader population. Um, so those two, two things go hand in hand. One of them is more commercially minded. The other one is, is more brand associated, but certainly benefits. Interpersonally and, and relationship wise at work, um, it's certainly helpful to have uh, multiple generations uh, because you get different ideas, you get different references and touch points, you get different uh, different ways of working and problem solving. Um, and so, I just think across the board, there are there aren't downsides to having a multi generational workforce. There are challenges in making that multi generational workforce highly productive. Uh, but if you can get to a level of productivity you will see that they, they can achieve a tremendous amount of success. Yeah, I think the challenges are where a lot of HR people are getting caught up, like just hearing feedback from their leaders, from their managers, from their employees. And they're like, oh, God, I'm getting all this feedback about X, Y, and Z, and where is this really stemming from? And people are so different, and how do we lead them? So I think that is a very good call out. And I know how you said about how culture it's worth making sure that you can assimilate. The thing that I want to talk about for just a brief second is – leadership styles. And I'm thinking about this because we're dealing with all these challenges in the workplace. And I do have leaders that come to me and are like, I'm dealing with a very young workforce. I don't know what to do. How do I relate to them? Like, do you have any sort of styles that you think are going to be the most effective when you're managing this very diverse multi-generational workforce? Is it is your advice going to be like, just assimilate and treat them all the same? What do you think? Um, I have... Uh 
let's call them uh, touchstones on things that I believe about how to lead people that are multi-generational. Uh, so one of them is how you recognize uh, and reward uh, you know, success and performance. I think that that should be consistent across generations. I think how you establish accountability standards should be consistent across generations. Um, I think how you communicate and the level of transparency that you display and expect should be consistent across generations. So the question to me is around implementation. Uh, does someone need a hug or a, a kind of like a nudge, right? Or a push or, you know, how, what, what is the kind of level of, um, intensity, uh, and, um, uh, directness in the feedback, I think is really important. And that is certainly, certainly a, a way to think about multi-generational implementation. Um, but the standards should be consistent across, uh, all generations. Uh, this goes back to something we talked about last week and having codified leadership principles. Uh, and those leadership principles should translate into um, standards for how you engage. Uh, but then you can implement differently depending on the generation. So, you know, we talked about these in the context of stereotypes, but uh, the baby boomer generation really likes clear direction. Um, they want to know who is uh, making the decision. They want to know how the decision is going to be made. Uh, and they're comfortable when that is clear, concise, uh, and the expectation is set. Millennials like a more democratic decision-making process where their voices are heard and they can be involved. Uh, and as long as, again, expectations are set, um, they also appreciate a level of equity and fairness in whose voices are being represented. Uh, and so thinking about, you know, not just, oh, I, I, I went to the team and asked, and you keep going to the same person every time to get feedback. Uh, you know, a level of equity is, is, uh, required there. Um, and then with regards to Gen Z, um, you know, they appreciate, uh, authentic and transparent leadership, um, in the way that, uh, in the way that, um, millennials do. Uh, but they also want to feel like there's a pace setting and like a change happening. Uh, and so how do you make them feel like, they can be a part of that, a part of that change is a unique aspect for that generation. So, you know, overall, I think the structures and the standards need to be consistent, whereas the implementation can uh, be multi-generational and bespoke. I like that. I mean, like, that's always what we should be doing when we're working with people specifically, like on their wants and needs. Like we also, we always want a system of equity as HR. Like we want to build a system that benefits everybody. But then when it comes to individual approaches, I always think like people are different and want different and need different things and making sure that you can tailor it would make you a great leader. I, I hate that one size fits all shit. I'll give you an example. Um, when I would make an announcement uh, in my company, uh, I would send an email, I would send a Slack message I would post something on a physical bulletin board at the office uh, and we would post it. We have a, a communications app. I would also post it in communications app. I would then talk about it during a weekly all hands. So I would deliver the same message, five different communication platforms to make sure that everyone received the message because it depends on where you, you as an individual user best receive communication. Right. So I, as a, as a leader, need to communicate that message through five different channels uh, in the hope that it is received through at minimum one channel by somebody. So that is how I would, I would think about this in, you know, how do I lead across different generations? It does require more of you uh, as a leader. But it benefits you in the long run. Like you, you're some, the, I'm not even going to pull stats about engagement and how when you're a better leader, your employees are more engaged and more productive. They can do all the things. Everyone listening knows that already. So I five different ways to do that. I mean, we also do that at work week, but that is exhausting. I also think it's interesting. Okay, wait, we're getting to the we're getting to the good part of the episode, the future part, because I think I want what I'm going to say. I need to hold until I get to the future part. But as we're thinking about this, like how do you future proof your organization? to actually accommodate for all the evolving expectations of younger generations while also ba balancing kind of what the other generations in the workplace want? Like, am I going to have to be communicating with Gen Alpha via a game and roadblocks in the future? Maybe. 
<laughs> well, like the point I was going to make was like video is so big and I've seen a lot of companies really leverage like TikTok style videos to showcase their culture, to showcase important messages, to showcase leadership spotlights, CEO messages. And I think that not enough companies do it today, but we're going to see the use of video substantially go up in the next two to five years. We would use a tool called Loom where uh, you would explain. So I, I think part of that is context gets lost in text and tone gets lost in text. Um, and y you know this because you write a weekly newsletter, uh, but writing is not easy and being a good writer requires work. And so, so much of work is text-based, introducing video and voice changes how you work and the tone and tenor of how messages are received. So I do think video plays a very important, uh, plays a very important role in the future. It could also be very important right now, depending on the tools that you have at your um, discretion at your company. Um, but certainly it resolves, um, it resolves uh, kind of miscommunication when it comes to tone. I will say also there is, uh, uh, I mentioned there's unconscious bias at play uh, across all, all of this, uh, all, all of this conversation. Uh, there is bias in how you are communicated with. Uh, some people do not like receiving voice notes uh, because they feel like, the, per the person on the other end is not considerate of their time. You know, I have to stop for a minute and a half to listen to this voice note uh, and stop what I'm doing. And, and so I, I would just consider that there's bias in all of these forms of communication as well. Uh, and so thinking through how you use them, when are they appropriate? The, the point I made around delivering the same message five, through five different channels it, it's not just a copy and paste job across each channel. You actually have to make the communication bespoke to each channel to maximize its impact. And so, you know, it, it, there's this, uh, I love like workplace jargon. Uh, this could have been an email, right? You never, <laughs> you never want to, you never want to make the video of the subject matter or topic that could have been an email. Right. Oh, God. And so just yeah. think, 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 think about that as you go to adopt these new tools. You know, does the medium support the message? Mm. That's a good place to leave that. I have one last future, one last future question. I like to end usually every episode with like a kind of a future question and maybe a little bit of advice. So you've given a lot of advice this episode. You've dropped so much knowledge. I like had to take notes while you were talking. And this is again why we're friends. But what advice would you give to other leaders on? you know, leveraging their multi-generational diversity in their workplace as a competitive advantage in today's world? Um, th there's this phrase that gets misused uh, a lot. An idea can come from anywhere. Uh, and you hear this uh, phrase a lot. Um, and it's often uh, just a platitude. But I think of uh, a company called Pixar that is a very millennial brand, uh, <laughs> but, but everyone knows. And when you join Pixar in whatever role, you go through employee onboarding. And in employee onboarding, they tell you a story about how a janitor gave an idea that made it into the movie Up. Uh, and it's about, um, I believe it is regarding the the, the little kid in Up is a Boy Scout, and I believe it's about the Boy Scout badges that, that he has. But a janitor gave an idea. And the reason why the janitor had the agency to give that idea is in employee onboarding at Pixar, they say, it doesn't matter what job you have or what you did before, you're a movie maker now. Hmm. And it's the idea that you can contribute meaningfully to the organization and the company. And so that is a role-based example, but I think the principle applies for a generational based example where an idea can come from anywhere. And I, I go back to uh, Meta and Apple making more and more products and services as the executive team ages for the age group that they're in rather than the age groups that they were in uh, as a poignant example of a way that they could have capitalized on these opportunities sooner 
um, if they had more diverse voices at the table who had the agency to speak around ideas and concepts. I didn't know that Pixar story, and that is a very millennial brand. <laughs> Not that I'm thinking about, I'm about to go make my list of millennial brands. That's, I mean, that's great advice. And we should, I just think I always come back to the more different people you have in the room, the better perspective and potentially more innovative solutions you're going to have. I think like every day out of every day, I would rather be in a room with people who are so different from me, different lived experience, different ages, different amounts of experiences. Like I think that is so much more powerful than being in a room surrounded by people who kind of have lived the same life you have lived. There's nothing wrong with that. Like if that's, we like look at your immediate circle, they're probably people who have the most similar lived experience that you have. But I think when it comes to multi-generational workplaces, being good leaders, building companies of the future, it's going to come down to the thing that the, all the stuff that makes us different is actually the stuff that also makes us strong. And I think more companies should be thinking about how do I reach different audiences? How do I reach people, different perspectives and lived experiences and build a more diverse and inclusive company? It's a great way to end my season. I don't know if that was like, a, was that inspirational enough, Dave? Should I, should we say like another inspirational quote? I'm inspired. I don't know. I have the same monotone voice sometimes. So when I'm excited, I'm like, I'm so excited. People are like, are you? And I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> That's also probably a millennial thing. Oh my God, the millennial pause. Okay, anyways. It's, 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 more, it's more a code switching thing, honestly. Really? Yeah, probably. Okay, God, we'll do yeah, that for next season. Next season, we'll cover this, my code switching. You can't be... Uh, not that you can't be, but I'm sure you've been. Um, let's just keep it moving. We're gonna make time <laughs> up, okay. okay, that's a good teaser though, because we'll maybe come yes. back to that for next season. I do have like a little teaser on next season, which if you're listening still to this episode, <laughs> you're you're in luck. Um, I think next season I am going to do a whole season and bring speakers on and have them share their zone of genius. It's a phrase that I love. There are things that make us, we're all very passionate about. I'm sure my zone of genius would just be Buffy the Vampire Slayer references, but everyone has a zone of genius. So my next season, I'm bringing on speakers who really have passion and energy and a genius around a certain topic. And it can be anything and everything in HR. So it's going to be a good season. Dave, um, will you come back? Will you accept this rose and come back to the the podcast next season of, of course i will accept your millennial bachelor reference uh, yeah. come back next season. yeah so you'll have to think about your zone of genius although i can think of a lot of things but that's really up to you to pick it i will not suggest um thank you so much for joining me for the two parts of the podcast giving me time and attention and sharing with every listener honestly your immense expertise and great perspective um where can they find you other than linkedin because you know i ask this question every time and the answer is always linkedin um at nyc ddg on all social channels <laughs> you said that comment, last time like too. and subscribe you comment like and subscribe wait this is the part of the episode i'm supposed to tell people don't forget rate this podcast tell everyone that you love it because you know the more that you do that the more brilliant guests i can bring you and the more i get to be in your ears every monday to get you through your terrible work week anyways that's a wrap on season i don't know what number it is but i'll be here soon enough next month i thank you dave and thank you everyone listening thanks for tuning in Keep up with all the latest HR resources by subscribing on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen. And if you love I Hate It Here, tell an HR friend. I'll see you next time.